has to have its revisionist. And so I'm going to make a slight uh, revision to Steve's statement about the meeting between Steve Whitfield and <laughs> Joyce. <laughs> it's not exactly a revision. It's to uh, amplify it, which was uh, that that encounter took place when I gave my talk at the um, Red, when I was a fellow at the Bunting Institute, and I seated you next to Joyce, because you had told me that Brandeis was going to have I said, you have to sit next to my friend Joyce Hitler. So that is the real history. So that was not how I was going to begin, but I had to set the record straight. And I was going to begin also on a slightly light note, which is um, as I was packing uh, to leave New York, uh, to come here, I was looking through my closet and I was trying to find some item of clothing that um, I had bought on one of the many excursions Joyce and I took. <laughs> At every conference we went to, we would leave the conference to go shopping. And there we were wandering like mutton chap, the one tall, the one short, the one elegant, the one kind of dumpy, uh, wandering the streets of Toronto, St. Louis, San Francisco, uh, Washington, um, and uh, some, and usually it was, often, it was often based on something I had forgotten to buy, uh, to bring with me from home, but lots of earrings and jackets and so on were acquired, and we talked on those um, shopping excursions about shopping, and we talked about our daughters, 
okay, had much to say about that, um, and they had much to say about us, and I'm sure we'll hear about that from Warren. But we also talked about a few other matters, and that would be the more serious segue into my talk. We talked about American studies, we talked about uh, American Jewish history, we talked about women's history, and how we as uh, scholars uh, engaged with these uh, three fields of um, uh, intellectual work. So I thought as I was uh, um, preparing for this event that I would offer a few words on um, the intersection between those three uh, uh, topics that Joyce and I again, between trying on clothes and looking at earrings uh, and many, many other um, encounters uh, um, uh, shared with each other, namely the field of uh, the study of Jewish women in America. Uh, this is a specialty within all three of those, which Joyce has not contributed to, but I'd say she's shaped. She created that, those fields, or that field, she made it her own, and she uh, did it in such a way that everyone would have to always think about what Joyce said, what Joyce wrote, how Joyce conceptualized it. The history of Jewish women in America uh, is a uh, endeavor which says, uh, for one thing, that place matters. That is, this is a history that played itself out in America. It's an endeavor which says the group matters. Okay? That is, this category Jewish uh, is a significant analytic uh, 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 enterprise and something we should be thinking about, and that women have a history worth exploring. Uh, putting them all three together, uh, we have uh, in this American Jewish Women, the history of Jewish women in America, something uh, that uh, should give us pause. Um, so what I'd like to do for my talk is to break these uh, three down into the American, the Jewish, and the women's, and to offer some hints, can, because I can't do anything more, on how these three histories, uh, how the history of, um, uh, how, how these three histories uh, uh, were uh, in interacted with each other, what universe of meaning we can find in the American, uh, the Jewish, and the women's. Now, um, I want to offer one caveat before I move on, which is to say when I use words like more and less and different and distinctive, I don't mean these as better. I don't mean them as uh, something that was good, something that was uh, more impressive, less impressive. It just is based on uh, empir empirical, measurable, uh, evidence-based comparisons uh, that Jewish women in America had a history that made them different from Jewish women elsewhere, that made them different from other American women, and made them different than Jewish men. So let me in fact, structured my remarks around those three variables. Mm -hmm. So on the American part, that is what made Jewish women in America different than Jewish women elsewhere, I want to concentrate on the religious sphere, primarily the formal communal public world uh, uh, of uh, Judaism in America. And here, uh, I think we can say that Jewish women in America asserted themselves, particularly in the synagogue, the most visible way in which that uh, Judaism was played out in the uh, public sector, um, uh, uh, unlike their sisters uh, any place else, uh, at the time, uh, any place else, much more than Jewish women elsewhere uh, from the 18th century uh, onward. Uh, Jewish women uh, defined uh, public, the public place of Judaism as something that they had a voice in and something that uh, they could uh, uh, impact. We can see this just in terms of their attendance at synagogue, that is from relatively early date in the history of American Judaism, rabbis commented and complained that synagogues were becoming increasingly feminized as women showed up more often than men, Synagogues were supposed to be places for men, and here is this American institution where women were showing up. Uh, women, even when they had no formal membership and no woman could belong to a synagogue until 1894. So until then, all women who attended, attended as one might say guests, uh, but even though they were not members, they could not vote, they could not hold office, they could not receive honors, they saw themselves as entitled to shaping the way in which the synagogues uh, functioned. 
demanding changes in where they could where they would sit and how the uh, synagogue would function. Throughout the 19th century, while women continued continue to occupy their status of inequality within the institution, they created a set of uh, ins extra synagogal institutions which had tremendous impact upon the synagogues. And here I'm thinking about the mid 19th century female Hebrew benevolent associations founded in one town after another, independent of the synagogues, very different from the synagogues, but yet institutions created by women in which, among other things, women amassed pretty hefty treasuries, that is, they became very good fundraisers at very early dates. And uh, the uh, men in their congregations, because the men had the congregation, in fact, in the uh, minutes of these female Hebrew benevolent associations, they would refer to the synagogue as the gents. Okay, they didn't mean Gentile, they meant the gentlemen's <laughs> synagogues. And the gents would ask the women from these female Hebrew benevolent associations to give them their money uh, because uh, they, the gents, wanted to buy, now to buy a building because they had previously rented or they wanted to rent a better space. And the women very much said, no, it's our money and we will determine when this town can have a synagogue because we're not going to give you the money until we agree. Uh, so uh, the, similarly, the founding of the National, Com Com National Council of Jewish Women in the 1890s uh, provided a place in which Jewish women uh, could begin to impact the synagogue in as much as National Council uh, began to ask uh, rabbis for, if nothing more, one Sabbath a month where it could be council Sabbath. Okay, where the council could, uh, members of national council could uh, run the service. Rabbis often gave them this privilege in the summer, okay, uh, when they assumed most members would be off on vacation. Uh, again, gliding through this very quickly because uh, time uh, moves on, um, it, is American, it is among American Jews both men and women, that we see the beginnings in the 1920s of uh, the bat mitzvah. Okay, so this is an American innovation. And by uh, the 1950s, the uh, uh, innovation of uh, women counting in a minion, that is a woman can be counted as one of the 10 required for a prayer quorum, uh, was something uh, not replicated uh, elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, later on, uh, the demand by women for ordination for the rabbinate and the cantorate, uh, the development of new rituals by and for women, uh, for example, the adoption of uh, Rosh Chodesh, okay, the beginning of the month, as a women's ritual, although it, it certainly had origins and roots in much earlier, in, in, in the Middle Ages, um, the uh, uh, formal See, t uh, taking of Rosh Chodesh and making it a feminist institution was an American one. Uh, so to the uh, development of rituals for the naming of a baby girl, okay, something that uh, would be uh, equivalent in terms of mm -hmm. grandeur and um, uh, pu its public nature as um, the uh, circumcision for a boy. Uh, this was an American innovation. Uh, calls to change the lit liturgies, to include the imahot, the uh, matriarchs, uh, all make the story of Jewish women in America one that had no parallel in other Jewish communities. Other Jewish communities over time, that is places like England and Germany and Israel, uh, began to look at what American women, Jewish women had done and said, we'll incorporate some of that also, but this was an American story. Okay, the Jewish part of it. That is, how did Jewish women in America have a history that made their experience different than the history of other women? Uh, now, obviously, a subject of uh, such uh, uh, breath that uh, uh, what I'm going to say uh, does violence to it in terms of um, uh, how little I can say. But here, obviously, holding class and race uh, a constant, we might uh, very fruitfully look at the uh, period of the uh, Great Migration from the 1870s uh, through the 1920s as a moment, in, a long moment in time where we see something about a distinctive um, uh, 
uh, Jewish experience among uh, American women, particularly thinking about immigrant women. So for one thing, the demographics of their immigration were just different. Okay? That is, not only did uh, men and women migrate in equal number, unlike uh, their fellow immigrants uh, in steerage from Italy, where men way outnumbered women, or uh, from many other parts of um, Eastern and Central Europe, uh, but also uh, in a very typical pattern of um, segmented family migrations, uh, married men who migrated, married Jewish men who migrated, unlike married Italian men who migrated or married Polish men who migrated, uh, married men who migrated, Jewish married men who migrated brought their um, daughter, their, if their older children were daughters, they brought their, their daughters with them because women were defined, young women were defined as able-bodied workers. Uh, and this is very much explained by the tremendous Jewish concentration in the garment trade, uh, in which uh, girls' hands could work just as well as uh, men's hands. And so that the demographics of the migration made for a very different uh, pattern. Uh, partly for that reason, and partly because of the nature of the garment uh, industry, uh, we also see another uh, measurable fact which made the experience of Jewish women in the immigrant period I want one that uh, made their uh, history uh, notable and uh, worth pausing at. Uh, one figure that emerges from 1920 is that 25% of all organized women workers in America were Jewish. Okay. Uh, so that is, uh, Jewish women made up a quarter of the uh, uh, population of women who belong to trade unions. Now, the figure should be kept in, con in the context of first Jews were at that point about 4% of the population. Okay? And in addition, that uh, sizable chunk of the Jewish female population that belonged to trade unions were single women. That is because Jewish women tended to drop out of the paid labor force when they married. So that is, we're dealing with a relatively small population still accounting for an enormous percentage of uh, those women who decided that it was in their interest, in the interest of their family, uh, and a good social policy uh, to join unions. Okay. So the demographics of the migration, uh, the uh, membership in the trade unions in the uh, uh, 19, by up to the 1920s, uh, tells us uh, points to a history uh, that uh, made the experience of Jewish women notable and different uh, than the histories of uh, many of uh, other American women at the same uh, place in the Americanization process, uh, in the class process, and uh, the like. Okay, finally, how did they experience, perhaps this is the one that needs the least comment, but I think it's still worth uh, uh, having out on the table, how did the uh, experience of Jewish women in America differ differ from the experience of Jewish men in America. <laughs> that is, why break out the experience of Jewish women from the larger history, uh, larger construct of uh, American uh, Jewish history? How did their con experience constitute something that made women and men very different? And again, there's so many ways in which this could be uh, measured. There's so many ways in which it could be looked at. And here I want to take as a sort of starting point uh, what we can think about as the unequal distribution of resources based on gender within the Jewish world, a world in which uh, men and women were defined as having different uh, uh, privileges, uh, uh, different uh, resources were to be expended upon them. Uh, many of the life histories and studies done at the time by uh, uh, investigators found, and it's a very small point, but still one worth uh, pondering, that young Jewish working women uh, that is, daughters and families, were expected to turn over all their wages to their parents. That is, they went off and worked, and they had to give their wages to their parents, while their brothers did not. The brothers were considered to be good and wonderful and helpful when they gave some of their wages to their parents. <coughs> so definitely an unequal uh, distribution of resources on a very, uh, again, measurable way, not needing to rely on life histories or on uh, the observations of uh, social researchers. Uh, Jewish men and Jewish women uh, often worked in the same factories, that is, they were uh, both 
in the immigrant generation, uh, concentrated in the garment trade, and uh, some of the jobs were done only by men, and some of the jobs were only done by women, but most of the work were done by men and women doing the exact same operation, uh, that is, they were sewing machine operators. Both men and women sat behind sewing machines and churned out garments. Okay? And uh, what uh, is probably perhaps not very surprising, uh, but worth noting, is that women got lower pay for the exact same work. Okay? So when uh, 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 feminists and uh, advocates for uh, uh, women's rights uh, demanded uh, equal pay for equal work, they were offered and stymied because men and women actually rarely did the same work. Okay, and how do we measure a coal miner versus which not really men did, and a domestic servant? Only women did. But here was one of the few places in the American economy where men and women did exactly the same thing, sitting next to each other, side by side, in front of um, or behind the sewing machines. And Jewish women got less pay for the same job that their uh, uh, brothers and uh, male co-workers uh, uh, performed. Additionally, uh, that uh, for the uh, uh, involvement of Jewish women in uh, the trade unions was primarily, in fact, almost exclusively at the membership level because the, le the levels of uh, leadership were exclusively the domain of Jewish men. And that is, men got to lead, women got to follow. Not that there weren't exceptions, but all of those exceptions, women like Rose Schneiderman, seethed with uh, resentment okay, at the way in which uh, uh, their abilities and their uh, uh, power of persuasion, uh, their competence in uh, creating a uh, uh, union were always undermined by their own, the men from their own uh, community. We can uh, furthermore uh, look at the field of Jewish education, and I know we have a number of uh, very important uh, uh, scholars of Jewish education in the audience here, and uh, the issue of Jewish education was one which consumed um, Jewish communal leaders uh, for centuries. And notably, almost until the post-World War II period, nearly every Jewish child in America who got a Jewish education was a boy. Okay? That is, uh, and again, exceptions certainly uh, uh, could be found, uh, but a Jewish education uh, in the main, and we're talking about more than, way more than uh, 50, 60 percent, uh, was uh, focused on educating boys and girls were defined as just not in need of that education. Okay, Jewish women, unlike Jewish men, had to constantly and consistently justify their public work. They had to uh, defend uh, their power in the civic arena. I already mentioned the female Hebrew benevolent associations uh, who had to defend their right to hold the their, their own treasuries and uh, keep that money to themselves. Uh, so to uh, National Council of Jewish Women, uh, found itself in dispute uh, or with uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, a men's organization, over uh, the uh, monitoring, the uh, uh, running of a uh, station at Ellis Island to assist uh, single immigrant women uh, who uh, might uh, be uh, uh, put in some harm's way given that they, if they didn't have relatives to meet them. Uh, National Council of Jewish Women began the project and <coughs> it was so successful that the men's group wanted to take it away from them because obviously it was way too important for women to do. Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, Hadassah, uh, which emerged as America's largest uh, Jewish organization um, and certainly one of the most uh, popular and significant uh, branches of uh, the Zionist movement in America, was repeatedly asked by the men if they would just give them their vote okay, um, at a number of world Zionist congresses. Okay. So in each case, the women refused. But in each case, they had to uh, enter into this uh, uh, dispute with uh, men over who had the right to uh, function in the public sphere, who had the right to exercise uh, uh, power within um, the uh, public arena of Jewish life. Uh, the need to make to defend themselves 
uh, in essence, made their history different than that of men because nobody questioned the right of men to organize the community. So I know my time is running out, um, and so I want to end by saying uh, um, this extremely um, quick uh, excursion into um, the history of American Jewish women, uh, taking uh, as significant the fact that this was played out in America, uh, taking as significant uh, the Jewish factor, uh, and uh, certainly making, foregrounding the experience of women uh, is something to which we uh, owe our debt to Joyce. Okay. Joyce uh, made this field, she gave it its prominence, and uh, therefore um, I would probably not be here uh, offering this without her. Thank you. students um, who will be giving the, the other two presentations on this panel. Um, and uh, I can only note that, uh, as a, they are undoubtedly going to um, uh, pay tribute to her for her role as a teacher and as a mentor, um, I should also say, as Joyce's colleague in the Department of American Studies, um, that uh, we, of course, are privileged to have the sorts of students that both Allison and Robin uh, represent and embody this, after, this morning and during this conference. Um, our next speaker is Allison Kibler, um, who teaches at Franklin and Marshall, um, and 